Hi everyone, this video is the fifth part of my Unit Zero Science Practices series for AP Psychology students. At this point, you have a general understanding of how psychologists conduct different types of research methods. In this particular video, I will go into detail about one of those methods, which is called experimentation. To begin, here's a look at the key focuses of this video. By the end, you should be able to answer these two questions. What are the basic elements of experimental methodology and can you identify experimental design components when evaluating research studies? You will also be able to define the essential concepts listed here. You might notice some reoccurring terms on this list. Hopefully you remember a few of them. This entire video will guide you through one of the skills the College Board wants psychology students to be able to master, and that is what they call Practice 2, Research Methods and Design. This video will focus in on 2B, which asks students to be able to evaluate appropriate use of research design elements in experimental methodology. If you notice underneath that highlighted section, there's multiple steps like, like state the hypothesis, identify the operational definitions of variables, and so on. On each slide following this one, you'll notice a note just like this. These notes come from this practice two section, and they are the different tasks that you need to be able to do and identify in experimental studies. Throughout this video, I will focus on one hypothetical experiment, and I will identify all of those parts in this example experimental study. So for this video, I will use the example of testing the effects of a new herbal tea. So suppose there is an herbal tea company and they are making claims that drinking their herbal tea will increase positive moods and decreased depressive symptoms. And as you can see at the note on the bottom of this screen, the first thing that you will need to do with an experimental study is state the hypothesis and determine whether or not it is falsifiable. So if researchers want to test these claims that this herbal tea will cause a reduction in depressive symptoms, they will need to set up an experimental study that can determine cause and effect. And they will need to start with having a testable prediction or a hypothesis. And remember, it needs to be falsifiable, meaning that the hypothesis is clear enough that we know what it means to disprove or approve the uh, results. So a hypothesis with clear variables that can be measured with clarity would look something like this. Participants who drink this herbal tea daily for four weeks will show at least a 30% reduction in depressive symptoms compared to the baseline, while those who drink a placebo tea will show no significant change. This prediction or this hypothesis is testifiable. The variables are clear and measurable, and I know the criteria for accepting or rejecting this hypothesis. So in short, this hypothesis is falsifiable because it could be disproven based on the evidence produced at the end of this, this experiment. So next, let's start with some definitions of variables. The independent variable is the part of the experiment that the researcher changes or manipulates. The dependent variable is the part of the experiment in which the researcher measures. And confounding variables are any other factor that, if not controlled, could influence the results of the study. So with these definitions, I'd like for you to pause the video and see if you can determine what the independent variable, the dependent variable, and what some potential potential confounding variables could be in this study. So if we are studying this herbal tea and determining whether it can reduce depressive symptoms, the independent variable would be the herbal tea. This is the part of the experiment that the researcher is changing and manipulating between the two groups. The dependent variable is the level of depressive symptoms. This is the part that the experimenter is measuring. And as far as confounding variables, you could have come up with a variety of possible factors that could influence the study if we don't control for them or account for them. And these could be things like the participants' diets, or if they're taking any other kinds of medications that could affect their mood, if they're undergoing any other treatment or therapies for their depression, if they have any emotional events that happen during the study that could impact their mood, or even their baseline uh, depressive feelings when they were starting the experiment. If these aren't accounted for, they could interfere with the results of this study. So these are the variables. Hopefully from part three of the video series, you remember that operational definitions are an explanation of the exact procedures and variables in the study so that future researchers can replicate the same operations and variables. 
In the previous slide, we determined that the independent variable is the mood enhancing herbal tea and the dependent variable is the depressive symptoms. So the operational definitions for these variables would give us more details about those variables. What does it mean by tea? What is the tea? How much is being given to the participants? When is it being given? Um, and then as far as the dependent variable, what do we mean by a depressive symptom and how are we measuring it? So on just a, a quick side note, this is something that psychology students have to do a lot on the AP exam. It's very common to be asked to operationally define the dependent variable. So in this particular study, I will go through and operationally define these two variables for you. So in this particular example of herbal teas and depressive symptoms, um, our independent variable, the operational definition would be the particular mood enhancing herbal tea. It is something that participants are consuming one cup a day for four weeks. So that's a description of what the variable is and how it's being used and how much. Um, the dependent variable uh, can be operationally defined as um, depressive symptoms are um, mood symptoms measured on the Beck depression inventory. The tool being used is going to give participants questions that they will answer and then it will yield a number score and higher number scores indicate more severe depressive symptoms, whereas lower number scores are less severe. Um, they're going to be administering these assessments at two different points. The first time is before the study starts to get a baseline of the depressive symptoms. And then after the study ends, after they've taken the T or not taken the T, and then determining what their score is at the end of the study after those four weeks. And so that would be an operational definition of the dependent variable, how that is being measured. If you've been following along in this series, you should also be familiar with sampling. That was covered in part three. I wanted to include it in this section just so that you can see this is another step that you would need to be able to evaluate in the experimental um, research design process. And when you're looking at re uh, research studies, you should look at sampling and notice some of these different elements. So rather than going into depth about these different parts, since you already know, I will just give you a few tips, things that you should be aware of when you are looking at the samples being used. So the first, you should notice sample size. A sample size that is larger increases the likelihood that it represents the population better. So for example, if you study a population of a thousand people and your sample is only 10 people, that might not reflect the population as well as if you drew a sample of 350 people. The second thing is random sampling. Using random sampling methods ensures that every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected, and that can help us avoid a selection or sampling bias. And if you decide to use a convenient sample, you run the risk of possibly selecting an unrepresentative sample. A representative sample is a sample that reflects the diversity of characteristics in the population, things like age, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or any other relevant characteristics. And then lastly, replication should be something you're also looking at and thinking about in regarding a sample. If the study has been replicated with different samples and different settings, this can provide evidence that it is more reliable or generalizable. Next, we'll go into grouping, and I'll start with a few definitions. In experimental research, you'll have two groups. You'll have an experimental group and a control group, and these are the two groups that the participants will be divided up and placed into. The experimental group is the group that receives the independent variable, and the control group is the group that does not receive the independent variable. This is important because you need to be able to compare the results from the experimental group to the, the results of the control group. So in our mood enhancing herbal tea situation, the participants will be placed into an experimental group. That group will receive the herbal tea and drink the herbal tea daily for four weeks. The participants that are placed in the control group will not. And the next thing that's important to know is random assignment. And random assignment is usually confusing for students because it sounds like random sampling. So you might take a second and think back, what do I know about random sampling before I tell you this definition?
So when researchers have gathered their sample and they have the participants for the study, they're going to need to determine how to put them into each group. And they should use a random assignment method, which randomly puts and places subjects into the control group and randomly assigns patients or participants into the experimental group. So every participant has an equal chance of being placed in either the control or the experimental group. A placebo is an inert or an inactive substance. That placebo looks, tastes, feels a lot like the active treatment that's being given to the experimental group. The, in experimental studies, placebos are given to participants in the control group, so they're not aware of whether or not they are receiving the independent variable or not. Placebos help to minimize biases, including participant bias, where participants, if they have knowledge that they are receiving the treatment, it could influence their outcomes. Or if the researcher uh, knows who is receiving the particular substance, that could influence their interpretation of the results. So our mind and our expect expectations have powerful effects on our perceptions and sometimes just the belief in the power of the treatment can influence our results rather than the treatment itself. And this has been seen in the use of placebos and it's called the placebo effect, which happens when a participant experience a perceived or actual improvement in their condition after receiving the placebo. This effect is attributed to the participant's expectations and beliefs about the impact of receiving the treatment rather than the placebo itself having a direct effect. Next, it's important to control for as many variables as possible in experiments because researchers want to know if it's the independent variable that's causing the results and to what extent. And so they're wanting to account for any other factors. And as I mentioned with placebos, our expectations alone can influence the outcomes of the survey. So researchers want to make sure that they are controlling as many expectations and human biases as possible. And blinding procedures can help with that. When researchers utilize a single blind procedure, this means that they're making sure that the participants do not know whether they are receiving the active treatment or the placebo. Simply put, the participants are blind in regards to whether or not they are in the experimental group or the control group. In contrast, a double blind procedure is one in which neither the participants nor the people administering the treatment and collecting the data know who is receiving the active treatment and who is receiving the placebo. And this can help control for experimenter bias. Experimenter bias refers to the unintentional influence that researchers can have on the outcomes of an experiment because of their own expectations or beliefs about the study. So so for example, if a researcher knows which group is receiving the placebo and which group is receiving the active substance, they one could unconsciously interpret ambiguous data in a way that supports their hypothesis, or two, they could give subtle cues or signals that might influence the way that the participants respond. They could also unintentionally selectively analyze their data or report their findings in a way that confirms their own expectations. So blinding helps to reduce that bias and ensure that the results are due to the treatment itself and not influenced by the expectations of the participants or the researcher. In part four, I touched on data collection and measurement. So this should be a review for students who have been following along so far. Let's just stop here and practice these terms, qualitative and quantitative research methods. Think about our study scenario and determine if you think that this particular research method measurement is using a qualitative tool or a quantitative tool. So if go ahead, pause, take a second, think about it. In this particular situation, the results are coming back as scores, not open-ended narrative responses. And since these are coming back as numerical values, we would consider this kind of measurement a quantitative measurement data collection. The scientific process is evolving and you know about these steps already, but this is how we conclude our study. After collecting the data and looking at the findings, the researchers will put this into a report and submit it for peer review. In the peer review process, 
Other experts are going to look at the methods, the data analysis, and the conclusions to see if they are sound and valid. And this helps to identify any flaws or biases or errors. And then afterwards, this will be replicated by future researchers to see if original findings can be reproduced. These steps are essential in the um, verification of reliability and validity of the results. So to close out the video, let's stop and do a quick check for understanding. Throughout the course, you will be presented with different studies. You'll be asked to identify the elements of experimental design. And let's practice with a new example. You will use this, same ex this very same experimental study for all five questions. After question one, I will only read the questions and not the study description. It will remain at the screen if you want to reread it. And like previous videos, I will not read the answer sets. So just be sure to pause the video to give yourself enough time to determine the correct answer. So this scenario goes, researchers wanted to find out if eating sugary foods would increase a person's ability to remember the names of U.S. presidents. The experiment involved 30 female and 30 male participants. A third of the participants, group A, were given cookies while studying names. A third, group B, was given nothing while studying names. The third final group was group C, which was given mint flavored candy while studying the names. They were tested on the names a day later. The researchers found that group A did substantially better than group B, but about the same as group C. What is the dependent variable in this study? Using the same experiment from question number one, what is the independent variable in this study? In the same study, which of the following is or are the experimental group or groups? The next question states, which of the following is or are the control group or groups? The final question reads, which of the following is the best conclusion for this study? This wraps up part five, experimental design. You can check those, those answers to the multiple choice questions at the bottom. You should also be able to do the tasks on the right hand side and define the following vocabulary words.